Deirdre, really appreciate you carving out some time today. Happy to be here. Well, listen, I'm looking forward to diving into some of your most recent work and talking all things models of, of obesity. But before we do, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your background and, and your current role. Sure. So I am a nutrition and obesity epidemiologist. Um, I got my doctorate in epidemiology and nutrition at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health in Boston. And I am an epidemiologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston, also and professor at the Harvard School of Public Health and back in the nutrition department. So I have not gone very far since my training days. Um, yeah, and that, those are my titles. Um, I'm also academic editor at the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And my research is largely focused on uh, observing and attempting to kind of illustrate and quantify the links of lifestyle, mostly diet uh, in relation to obesity, weight gain, and obesity-related chronic diseases. Yeah, I mean, it's such an important area, isn't it, with uh, two-thirds of the population in most Western countries overweight and obese and the burden that places on the healthcare system. And so, you know, today we're going to discuss different models of obesity, the, the carbohydrate insulin model and the energy balance model. And of course, your recent paper, the energy balance model of obesity beyond calories in and calories out. Which, which had a few main objectives, which was effectively to provide that current best representation of the energy balance model, because there's a lot of noise, let's call it, in terms of opinions on it, um, to distinguish it from a lot of those myths, and of course, to contrast it with that carbohydrate insulin model. So maybe the best place to tee this up is to start with just defining the energy balance model for us. Yeah, so um, the, the purpose of the energy balance model or any model of obesity or whatever the system of interest might be is, is to create a framework with in which you can test specific hypotheses and um, kind of erase some arrows, draw some arrows in, make uh, connections stronger, whatever the evidence is allowing you to kind of evolve along the way to, to tell the overall picture of what system is at play here. And for obesity, uh, the energy balance model that was put forth in this latest, or I guess reiterated in this latest review led by Dr. Kevin Hall and um, many colleagues was really outlining the EBM or energy balance model of obesity at its core uh, sounds like calories in, calories out. You're balancing energy in, energy out, but really it's, it's so much more than, than that title um, kind of alludes. And how calories are perceived in the environment, how they're metabolized and then expended and why calories are stored in, as fat potentially in excess are really what this model is trying to illustrate, both based on the evidence that we do have the evidence against it, and then what kind of questions are still remaining and needs to be established or fleshed out further, which of course there's more questions than answers. That's why this is a model, not a textbook. And um, you know, there, there are ways to kind of challenge the pathways that the model posits and <clears throat> further kind of refine the, the evidence that we have. And that's, I guess, what scientists do. And that's where the model, the model that we describe in the paper is where a lot of the evidence is, is basically pointing to today. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, this energy balance model proposes that the brain is the primary organ responsible for body weight regulation, but that's really not the messaging we even hear on amongst lay people when they, when they talk about this model. And in the recent paper by David Ludwig and colleagues, you know, they describe the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity as a better reflecting the knowledge on the biology of weight control as compared with the energy balance model. Now, which they say, you know, fails to consider some of these key biological mechanisms that promote weight gain. So can we sidestep here and just talk about what is that carbohydrate insulin model? And perhaps you can highlight some of the main arguments that they have against this energy balance model. Yeah, so the the energy balance model, which you described, is related to more of the uh, the function in the brain than uh, more peripherally throughout the body. Uh, it's basically saying that the environment is likely a major driver of the current obesity epidemic, which is what this model is attempting to describe. And um, you know what interacts most with the environment is probably our um, subconscious perception of cues and foods and inputs all around us. That's probably playing a big role. Um, and then when we look between individuals, so we're all essentially to some extent 
exposed to this new environment that's different from our food environment back in the 60s, why is there still heterogeneity and differences between individuals with obesity or um, overweight or just like basically what you might think of as susceptibility to this food environment? So there's clearly a non-environmental or genetic role that, that might be interacting with um, the environment around us. And so the, the EBM um, has the brain at the forefront, kind of processing cues from throughout the body that interact with the environment and the external cues. Um, whereas the CIM or this uh, carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, rather than the arrows of the environment going in to the human physiology, it's the human physiology seeking out more calories. And so this swapping of the arrows um, where obesity begets obesity and the biology that's proposed underlying this is um, proposes that, you know, as we consume high carbohydrate or high glycemic index diets, those are the, the diets that raised your blood glucose, glucose levels uh, more so than other foods postprandially. Um, this, this subsequent rise and then fall in insulin levels that uh, physiologically respond to your glucose cause your adipose cells and other peripheral tissues to take up more fuels than it probably should. So what's left in circulation um, is perceived throughout your body as not enough because too much was stored, right? So there's this excessive partitioning of fuels from circulation into um, some tissues more than I guess what you might consider their fair share. So then, you know, you're left a little bit hungrier than you should and you seek out kind of a corrective uh, amount of calories to make up for the perceived lack of fuel in circulation. So that's, you know, this arrow of kind of obesity is causing overeating rather than overeating causing obesity is the main distinguished um, aspect between the, the EBM and the CIM. And, you know, as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap between these models mm -hmm. as well, but that's probably the most striking difference in the yeah. branding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fascinating how in your paper, you, you describe how any valid model should withstand tests of, of various predictions and, you know, either be adjusted to, to suit those or, or abandon altogether. And, and most importantly, the models of obesity must explain just as you described that between person variability and also this recent global shift in terms of total distribution. So, you know, you know, the paper you outline from rodent studies, epidemiology, all the way through, maybe if we could start with perhaps epidemiology, you know, what could you give us sort of a lay of the lands of, of what's actually in the research at the moment, because obviously a whole host of other factors here, when we look at adherence, you know, types of fat in the diet, you know, the consumption of sugar or trends you know, in that consumption. Could you highlight and expand on that? Sure. So as an epidemiologist, the really spirit behind what we're doing is identifying a distribution of your exposure that explains differences in your outcome. So if we have an outcome or trait like obesity, um, we can look at uh, populations that have different rates of obesity and try to identify what exposures might explain that variability. Um, you can also look within the same population over time. So the obesity epidemic in the U.S. has served as a really interesting sort of like playground for hypotheses because we have, you know, over the course of just a few decades, obesity skyrocketing in prevalence. And so you can take essentially the same country with presumably many of the same um, you know, genetics, of course, we didn't evolve our genes in a matter of, Short you know, one time. or two generations. And, um, you know, culturally, maybe it's been relatively stable as well, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so you can look to see over time, what has changed in the same population, just like you can look kind of between populations or countries. Mm. Um, and if we do that in the US, just looking at averages, of course, there have been shifts in our, our food environment. And we all can anecdotally describe what a meal looked like in the 1960s versus today. Um, but the macronutrient distributions haven't been quite as dramatic as the you know, overall trends in manufacturing and uh, many of the other sort of like drivers that the EBM posits might be relevant for the obesity epidemic. So carbohydrates and fat, for example, um, fat intake did go down after the 1980s, 
And, you know, this is um, brought on um, in part by the dietary guidelines recommending a lower fat diet. Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit of a demand, but then also the supply met that demand and probably exceeded it by kind of pumping out all these low fat products that were very high in carbohydrates, mostly refined carbs and sodium and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so there was this shift towards refined carbohydrates and, you know, that very well could explain part of the obesity epidemic and likely does, but doesn't tell you anything about the biology, right? So that's what the models are trying to figure out. Um, but we also see a lot of other shifts as well and some consistent with the obesity epidemic trends and others, not so much. And we're not looking at an outcome like colorectal cancer, breast cancer, heart disease, where there's an expected lag between your your exposure, your diet, and your outcome many years or decades later, right? So something like obesity should track fairly consistently with whatever the exposure of interest might be. So there aren't too many striking um, exposures related to carbohydrate quality or quantity that mirror those trends. But again, this is just like the population level, right? So there's so many issues with extrapolating that to any sort of causation. And we know this is epidemiologists. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting just looking at that in terms of the adherence part, because that's sort of a cornerstone as part of the argument for that carbohydrate insulin model is the fact that it's just going to be easier for people to adhere to. But in your paper, you highlight, you know, again, population-based research showing that at varying degrees of carbohydrate adherence is the same, if not better. And so, you know, Obviously, we know that compliance is playing such a big role in terms of maintaining, you know, weight loss progress and, you know, even in things like exercise, it's a better predictor of of outcomes. Um, Can you speak to that a little bit in terms of adherence, you know, teasing out between these kind of lower fat, lower carb uh, diets? Yeah, absolutely. So if we go then from these population observational studies where we're just observing and monitoring trends, we're not intervening on anyone now to this more randomized trial or intervention setting. That's where we can really um, tease apart efficacy. So what are the actual effects of having someone eat this diet versus that diet or effectiveness, which is more telling someone to eat that diet versus telling someone to eat that diet, right? So if, if telling someone to do something is really just as effective as locking them in a ward and forcing them to eat it, then your efficacy and your effectiveness should be about the same. Mm -hmm. But if there's a mismatch there, if there's a big kind of gap between forcing someone and then asking them in terms of what they actually do, then you're asking almost two very different questions, right? What are the actual biological effects of carbs versus what are the effects of telling people to eat fewer carbs? So the um, carbohydrate insulin model One of the benefits that it proposes as a solution to the obesity epidemic, not just a cause, is that removing carbohydrates or having a very low intake of carbohydrates essentially allows your body to use its stored fuel more easily. So your insulin levels are down, which means like this this guard or this system that's keeping fat in itself, cells is down. So it's easier to mobilize and use as circulating fuels for the rest of the body rather than needing to eat or feeling hungry or um, seeking external sources of calories, right? So if you simply remove carbohydrates from the diet, you won't be as hungry. You'll be using your own food as fuel or your own um, storage as fuel. And um, adherence should essentially be a non-issue because you're uh, not having carbs. And if that's the cause of obesity, then you're fine. with the clinical trial data, especially that that's more in this effectiveness camp, like telling people to eat less carbs or less fat or whatever, um, then you should see the environment has no um, huge impact. It's really just the carbs. So if someone's eating fewer carbs, all these external cues about Doritos or whatever, like shouldn't matter yeah. if if your you know your internal cues or drivers are the only causes of obesity or weight gain. So, and in fact, that's not at all what we see. And what, seven years now ago, I led an extensive meta-analysis, which is basically statistically combining existing studies. And we included 
over 50 randomized trials that lasted a year or more. And David Ludwig is the co-author on that study, actually. We, you know, from the same institution over at, at Harvard and Nutrition mm-hmm. Department. Um, and our hypothesis there almost had nothing to do with carbohydrate intake and was addressing the low fat era that seemed to still have this kind of residual dogma that low fat was best for weight loss. And our hypothesis going in was that low fat, um, because it's, you know, potentially related to so many poor health choices in terms of like low fat products being more ultra processed and higher refined carbs may not in fact be better for longer term weight loss or weight gain prevention. And so we included all these low fat trials and When we look at low fat versus low carb, low fat versus other higher fats, essentially very little difference or benefit was found for low carb over low fat in these trials. It was about just over one kilogram, I think maybe two pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, So if there were some major benefit of just simply eliminating carbohydrates, then we would anticipate a greater benefit for the low carb diet. And then if you look at adherence within these trials, there were no differences. So again, if it's an internally motivated drive to choose to over, you know, to over consume calories, or, you know, even if it's not conscious, it's below the subconscious, that's clearly not what we're seeing in terms of low carb, just being better to adhere to, and that leading to more weight loss um, in the real world setting. So yeah, that, that literature doesn't really line up as well. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting at this point to see that, you know, if we're controlling for protein intake and we're controlling for energy intake, then like you said, it's not really mattering whether we're going low carb or low fat to achieve the weight loss yet, you know, still a major claim from the, when I see it, especially with practitioners or doctors who are ascribing to the carbohydrate insulin model is really in relation to hunger, you know, hunger seems to be this, this driving theme. And of course, in their paper, talking about the carbohydrate insulin model, talking about how patients may experience less hunger and improved energy levels. And of course, they call it spontaneous weight loss, I suppose. Now, you addressed this in your paper as well in terms of confounders. And you discussed this with some of the uh, outpatient controlled feeding studies around lower glycemic load, higher glycemic load diets and satiety. Can you unpack that a little bit for listeners? Yeah. So, you know, if you're attempting to isolate one specific component of diet, like glycemic index, which is what should be the predictor of carbohydrate quantity and quality and other foods that are being consumed in that meal. So this glycemic load is the overall picture of what we would anticipate physiologically your insulin response and your glucose response might be with a meal, right? So this glycemic load, taking all that into account is really difficult to manipulate between two diets without also changing many other aspects of the diet. So if there's a single feature that we want to kind of um, test in a model, then you have to hold everything else constant. Otherwise it's almost impossible to say, was it that switch or was it like all these other switches we had to switch at the same time, right? Yeah, so glycemic index is very difficult, if not impossible to achieve you know, having one diet low glycemic, one diet medium and higher, whatever it might be, without also changing quantities of either fat or protein or quality of carbohydrates. And as you start impacting these other sort of non glycemic index related features of your diet, of your intervention, then the causality can't be attributed to any one thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I almost wonder how impossible it might be down the road to even investigate this hypothesis, because unless there are some, you know, really well-controlled, and I'm thinking of like shakes or something like that, like meal replacements where you can, Mm -hmm. you know, very fine-tunely manipulate and control everything in the diet and, and know that you're directly comparing the one difference of interest I only, it makes it almost impossible to, to really tease out causally what is contributing to any effects that might be seen down the road. So if you see differences in satiety, if you see differences in weight and um, uh, fat mass loss and, and whatever it might be, then you can attribute those very specifically to the one thing you manipulated. Without that, it's confounding, even though we're talking about a clinical trial, because you just can't attribute it to one versus the other. Yeah. I mean, it gets 
tricky, doesn't it, in terms of even when we look at research on, on glycemic index, obviously with, with weight loss, not being able to, as you mentioned, you can't predict in terms of weight loss, whether it's a higher glycemic or lower glycemic, because we're influencing all these other factors. And of course, we see with some of the continuous glucose monitoring research that how I respond to a banana might be different than how somebody else responds to a banana in terms of their glycemic response or blood sugar response. And so that's could be obviously be playing a role here as well. Yeah. And then even within, within your own banana experiment, if you ate one this week and then ate one next week, you know, some of the CGM data are showing even within an individual, very different responses. Maybe a banana would have been, you know, toxic on a carb level today, but fine next week. So it's hard to say. Yeah. For sure. And if, if you had to sort of, you know, postulate or guess around, you know, some of the, you know, this, this notion of hunger being such a cornerstone, especially for a lot of docs who struggled themselves with weight gain and then realize some weight loss on say lower carbohydrate diets. This is again, a really area of a big focus. And oftentimes, you know, as a practitioner, I think to myself, the experience is still valid in terms of what they're experiencing. They're just probably ascribing it to something that's not quite there. And what other factors would you think might be contributing to that idea of the less hunger? Is it the fact that they're increasing protein intake or the vegetable and fiber intake goes up or some of these other downstream effects that happen when we change a diet? Yeah, I mean, it could be all of the above, and it probably is a multifactorial exposure or change that's occurring. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to know when someone experiences, um, you know, a shift in their diet and witnesses an outcome exactly what it was. But unless you have the person go do the exact same thing over again mm -hmm. without that or with a different exposure or diet and see what happens then, this kind of like counterfactual scenario of, what if I had manipulated this one thing differently than what would it have been? It's almost impossible to say. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's very desirable to kind of draw cause and effects in things we do and attribute it to something. And if, if the individual is satisfied with a diet and it works for them, I don't see any reason to like challenge what they're in their mind attributing it to. Um, but biologically and scientifically, that's not the like game that's being played, right? Mm -hmm. We're looking by the, the more biological black box that's occurring between the exposure and the outcome and why and how. And there is a lot of variability in a population between people. So, you know, there's not going to be, I think, one way that works for everybody or one biology, that's everyone's truth. Um, because we, you know, may experience the environment differently, but we might also have different genes that explain how we interact with that environment differently. And so there's expected to be a lot of heterogeneity anyway. And then to be able to kind of pin someone's experience on a specific metabolic pathway underlying that, I think would be, you know, if, if someone needs an anecdote, to support whatever their experience has been. Like, I don't see a problem with that. But again, when it comes to then elevating what science is finding to a population level, there needs to be more of an evidence base than that. And it seems even within that, that, you know, because the brain is central to the energy balance model, and we're talking about um, all sorts of signals, whether from the brain or from the gut that are controlling hunger, that that's that sort of hunger story would even fit within the evidence energy balance model, would it not? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the brain is receiving cues like constantly about every process going on in the body. And we don't really have a, a solid grasp on a lot of these, what exactly is being communicated when and why and how, but that's what I think the science is really exciting and, and interested in finding out. Um, but the, you know, communication between your body as it's digesting a meal or as it's, not eating and would like to eat with the brain is like at the forefront of why we then go out and seek food. So hunger is a, a, a huge cue. Um, but there's also uh, interactions and communications that occur kind of below this subconscious feeling of, wow, I'm hungry. And that's why, you know, when you're eating a bag of popcorn at a movie theater, you aren't reaching back in and eating Finish more because your body's like, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. Um, it's, you know, for, it, it might just be this passive overconsumption that occurs too. So, you know, I don't think it's, it's all just hunger and that's the only thing driving consumption. And if we just got a, a rein on that, we'd be fine. I think there's still a number of, of cues or exposures that we may not even be able to tangibly define yet that, contribute. And this EBM model, it allows for this complexity in the environment and how we interact with it um, and acknowledges that there is still a lot unknown. And 
I would love for it to be as simple as carbohydrates. I mean, that with my public health perspective and kind of stepping outside of the lab and just curiosity and mechanism from a public health perspective, like we need a solution to this obesity epidemic. It's a crisis that is so detrimental in many health outcomes and quality of life. And it's, you know, expanding globally to the point where it's, it's very concerning with some of the populations um, in terms of diabetes and downstream cardiovascular disease, diabetes, type two diabetes at even younger ages and, you know, having a solution. And if it was simple, like we just need to cut out the refined carbs would be fantastic. Um, and that, you know, would, would be not something I would personally be biased against, but, you know, as we illustrated in this most recent review, the evidence just isn't there as that being this single causal agent, we can just kind of pluck out of the food system to then put everything back to where it was kind of a few decades ago. So, yeah, I mean, it definitely, uh, with, with seeing patients and clients, I mean, you get the people are working seemingly longer hours, so they sleep less. And then, of course, later at night now, after long, stressful days, they tend to, you know, these ultra processed foods are kind of all around us. So it's Netflix and bag of chips or ice cream or wine. And now sleep quality is not so good. We wake up the next day a little more tired and whether we're caffeinating extra or again, we're having to navigate this environment of all these snack foods that are around us. It seems like environment would be playing a pretty large role. Yeah. Just, just looking at, say, European countries, when you being over here in the UK, it's interesting because the UK is similar to Canada and the US where over 50% of, ult, of, of household spending is on ultra processed food. And it's strange here because you can take a train for two hours and you're in France and all of a sudden it's 14%. And, and people, you know, the general, whilst there's still movement towards gaining weight, you know, it's a marked difference when you just look at the population yeah, yeah. across all of, of, of Europe and that sort of the exposure to these snack foods, whilst it's increasing, isn't quite the same as let's say North America, Canada, um, yeah. the U S now I'd like to just touch on the energy partitioning portion of, of, of the paper. I, I recently had professor Paul Larson on uh, Lucas Cyprian as well, and their work on very low carb diets in, uh, overfat individuals combined with, with HIIT training. And of course, you know, we know that for certain populations like type two diabetics, you know, reducing carbohydrate could have some obviously potential wins there in terms of uh, improving, you know, insulin resistance and these types of things. Now they noted that it, only the dietary intervention improved body composition. And, and Prof Larson was touching on the fact that, you know, from his point of view, he, this couldn't be explained by the calories in calories out model. Now, appreciate that I'm just throwing this out at you now, but if you know if you had to speculate again, is this sort of the energy partitioning portion of the paper? This is where I was sort of in reading it was thinking, but you know what part of the EBM model could be um, accounting for this you know reduction in visceral adiposity that seems to be happening without that major shift in energy? So you know where fat is being stored and and why and are macronutrients or some aspects of diet determinants of how fat is stored and where or how calories are utilized and mobilized and where, um, I think is is something that the CIM the carb carbohydrate insulin model has has really capitulated on, um, but is also very much part of the EBM in terms of they're having differential effects between carbs and protein and fat in where their circulating fuels might then tend to be stored or utilized. So if we think of visceral or central adiposity, um, that, you know, calorie is a calorie is not what EBM is, is stating. There very much could be metabolic differences between the fuel sources. And that's, you know, again, not quite the same conversation as weight gain and obesity. If we're talking about type two diabetes or insulin resistance or inflammation or, um, you know, fatty liver, like all of these other concerns metabolically with, with diet might take on a, a very different, um, conversation with, between the macronutrients. Um, and of course, obesity tends to be upstream of a lot of these. So what role do different macronutrients have in, in downstream effects on body composition or in the context of weight loss in, um, where weight loss is, is observed or coming from, I think is, consistent with EBM entirely. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like just another slice of the, of the model, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that, you know, the calories all being equal um, notion that is maybe just really unfortunate unbrand misbranding of EBM. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an, it's an oversimplification and I see it in almost every carbohydrate insulin model paper or book or chapter it starts with why EBM is flawed because it hasn't saved the obesity epidemic because telling people not to eat too many calories just hasn't worked. And I think this is, if a hypothesis has to start by like debunking another one, then it's almost a non-starter for me. Like, just tell me your science. Don't, mm. you know, have to put down another model incorrectly or mischaracterize it to whether intentionally or not to, to build your case, right? The one model being wrong doesn't by default make yours right. That's what I'm essentially trying to say. And so, sure. you know, the, mis the mischaracterization of the energy balance model as all calories are equal, you have uh, a thousand calories coming in and how you use them doesn't matter what they're comprised of equals, you know, whatever you're expended that day, the rest gets stored. That's, that's such an oversimplification. And I think everybody knows that by now. So it's, it's confusing while it keeps getting perpetuated as what the EBM is all about. And then there's also this kind of um, disconnect between what an obesity model might hypothesize and what's happening on the population level, right? So we talked about efficacy versus effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And of course, telling the population to eat fewer calories isn't going to be effective for reducing total calories, let alone staving off the obesity epidemic, because it's not the conscious overeating of calories that got us there in the first place that we're just asking people to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the cause of this obesogenic environment is now trying to be, I guess, like battled or, or put off with just having this willpower to overcome it. Like, of course, that's setting everyone up for failure. So it's, you know, assuming that that EBM is all about like willpower and people just need to try harder to eat fewer calories is also just a total misinterpretation. And when we say, you know, brain is at the center of this model, it's not necessarily saying conscious awareness and choices and hunger that you feel and then choose to act on. It's, it's brain communicating with your peripheral tissues below the subconscious awareness. And, you know, the cues that you um, observe in your environment because a food is comforting or palatable or whatever it might be, that again is probably operating well below your conscious radar. And um, so, you know, again, mischaracterization mm -hmm. has been an issue and I can see how the name is misleading. I mean, nutrition science, we have <laughs> a lot of really unfortunate misbranding issues and EBM is probably, you know, also prone to that. Great summary. And you know, in your opinion, when we look at the food environment, obviously corporations and big business are driving a lot of what we're being exposed to and they're making a lot of money. And when we look at what government has or programs have to offset that swimming upstream, to put it mildly, I mean, it's, in, in this sort of strong current that's pulling all of us down towards energy excess and, and overconsumption, you know, in, in your research or just your opinion and insights, you know, what are some of the things we can think about doing to start creating an environment where for the, again, the general population who are working long hours and lacking sleep so that yeah. the, the, the right decision just becomes the more default versus having to actively avoid all of the processed options on your way home when, you know, we know that when we're stressed and tired, those are going to be the things that the brain is, is kind of looking for. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like the billion dollar question, right? So there's almost no one single solution to kind of mm -hmm. wave a wand and get this environment to have the default, the healthy choice, because it's just so complicated and not just because of the food industry, but because of that, how society's changed in the last several decades. And mm -hmm. the fact that we are busy and tired and it's making a big, yeah. And having these easy or, you know, prepared for you already options for families on the go and individuals working many jobs or hours is, is important. And, you know, so I think it's not the default or the, the new environment or whatever it might be that that is envisioned isn't kind of going back in time. It's how do we work with what we have? Mm -hmm. And the, you know, a lot of the foods, the ultra processed foods in particular are like specifically designed to overcome your conscious choice that you're making. They're so doing when their you're, job very well. <laughs> yeah. When you're on the go or when you're exhausted or when you, you know, have a budget, like these foods know that 
And that's specifically what they're designed to attract you to purchase them over another product for, you know, every, all, all market share science comes down to this R and D, this research and development, which for foods is, is really heavy on um, getting people to be repeat purchasers. How do we make it tasty and affordable and on the go? And um, so I, I don't know how to overcome that. I think there's still a lot we don't know about why certain foods or food groups or maybe all of ultra processed foods do tend to lead to overeating or might be a cause of the obesity epidemic. I don't think we know exactly what it is about them. So maybe we can identify that, isolate that one causal factor or feature or whatever it might be and remove it, right? That would be kind of best case scenario, but I don't know that that's really what we'll end up finding. It could require much more substantial structural changes and buy-in from, you know, the food industries themselves and uh, who knows, but I think expecting people, society to just kind of try harder is not going to be the solution because that's not what it, what it's about. Yeah. It's always funny, this idea of discipline and willpower when you're talking about clients who are highly successful in their business life and their home life, and yet somehow they lack discipline in this other area, it sort of becomes this, this you know, this false narrative. And I imagine there's going to be a, you know, top-down approaches with that policy level where, you know, we see in some countries where a can of soda has 15 grams of sugar instead of 50. And, mm-hmm. and if you imagine that someone's consuming seven of those a week, I mean, that's a pretty significant amount. Um, and I, I suppose we could also hopefully see a lot of bottom-up approaches where we can get into communities and you know, help people afford more whole foods and these types of things. But it's like you said, that there's not going to be a one, a one solution that we weigh that, that, that does this, which makes it, you know, all the more pressing to really try to um, get as many of those bottom up approaches as we can, because everyone's sort of battling this together. Now, a couple more questions for you, but being yeah. in the same building as, as, as Dr. Ludwig, what mm-hmm. are some of the responses to the paper or, or the questions that, uh, or, or conflictions that come back? I'd like to think that we're all very collegial. Um, I was a teaching assistant in a course that Dr. Ludwig uh, guest lectured in for many years. And I've known him ever since I was, you know, master student. And there's no like ill will. I at least I hope not. There isn't on my behalf. But the department is very, in general, um, is very diverse in its kind of research areas and opinions. And there's, there's no sort of, I guess, one view that, you know, that's held because I think if anything, we acknowledge that there's still so much that's unknown and to have such a a strong stance would be probably premature. And I know that, you know, everybody's willing to see what the evidence might ultimately show, but but yeah, no, I, I respect Dr. Ludwig a, a great deal and have known him for pretty much my whole career. Sure. And any, any re- replies or responses to this paper from, from himself and that, that group? Um, or is that, that coming, I, coming down the road? <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably, I guess we'll wait and see. Um, Dr. Willett was a co-author on the, the paper and I co-teach with him and he thinks this is all just important science and more work is need to be done. So that there was a piece of feedback there. But um, yeah, I, I think that for the most part, you know, I, it's, everyone just wants to kind of resolve the epidemic and hopefully there aren't, you know, ill will or egos that take over and get in the way of that. But yeah, I, I would welcome a, a response. I think, you know, how, opening the doors of communication, even if it's this like volley back and forth of letters to the editor or something would still be um, hopefully moving in, in the right direction. So to sum up here in terms of the you know, the energy balance model, the carbohydrate insulin model, in terms of what they agree on, and correct me if I'm wrong here, both models agree that diet quality and composition are important in the prevention and treatment of obesity. And both models account for the endocrine regulation, the peripheral energy sensing and the energy partitioning. Now, could you sum up for us a little bit of what the both models disagreed on that we touched on here today? Yeah, I mean, I think both sides have illustrated the fact that there's this like causal arrow and it's just different between the two groups. So in the energy balance model, calories are, um, the arrow is going into the body and the brain and interacting and and having these complex interactions for obesity. Whereas in the CIM model, the arrow is going from the body or the adiposity to calories, 
right? So it's the adiposity or whatever tissues are accumulating calories, like almost requested and communicating to the brain and circulation. Now we need more fuel. So mm -hmm. that arrow going then out to the environment rather than in because of carbohydrates. So the end, whereas the energy balance model um, is not restricted to one particular fuel. Uh, so that those are, the, I guess, the main the main differences that I've as I've seen. And of course, there's a lot of complexity underlying that. But sure, I yeah. mean, folks could read the paper as well. I mean, it's tremendous. And you know, if we look at the next five or ten years of, of research in this area, what are some of the things that you know you're working on or that you find exciting in this space? Yeah. So I hope that. I don't get involved in any more, of course, famous last words, carbs versus fat research. I think it's just <laughs> time to move on. Yeah. Um, we've done, what would I say, over like 50 trials lasting over a year comparing carbs versus fat. And it's been this minuscule difference. And, you know, we're looking at an epidemic that's bigger than that. And we need real long-term solutions. So, you know, I'd love to see research more in the foods that people consume rather than specific um, nutrients or mechanisms, but of course, all of it has to be consistent and tell the same story. So, you know, work being in, done in parallel in all these different areas is great. So yeah, I, I don't, I'm not out to test or disprove or, um, you know, pull apart any specific model, I guess, as an epidemiologist, it's really just what is the evidence showing? What are some potential population level strategies? What potential impact would they have not only on obesity, but then diabetes and cardiovascular disease? I think keeping that bigger picture is really important and, you know, it can kind of get lost in the weeds a little bit once we start getting down into the nitty gritty. Um, so me personally, that's where my mindset is. Terrific. Well, very well said. And if we finish off here and zoom out to 30,000 feet, I mean, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a dad. We were talking earlier. I've got three little kids at home. You've got small children at home. If we think about this from our kids' generation and what we can do, your parents listening in, um, you know, what are some of the little things that we can do to help to support this sort of environment or to provide more real foods or to, you know, set them yeah. up for success? So, again, obviously lots of different strategies, but just curious in terms of some things that you might emphasize or, or you know, do at your house. Yeah. So I think, you know, as a parent, you ultimately have control over the kids' food environment when they're For home. For limited time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, daycare, school system, that might be less of something that there's control over. If you're packing a lunch, you know, you can determine what's in there. I pack my kids lunch once in a while they can buy, but I know it's, I know it's on the menu and it's terrible. So I, you know, like to have that control, whether they you know, hate me for it or not. Um, but, you know, at least you're setting them up for success where there's not just this big association um, with a, a poor quality food environment that, you know, comfort food or home food or whatever is probably on the healthier end than the ultra processed end. And mm. that as a parent is one thing you do have direct control over. Um, and if it's not in the house, then you don't have to have an argument about it. So that's a great, great last yeah. point. I like that. Yeah. Uh, tremendous. Well, I really appreciate you covering out some time today. Obviously, the papers, uh, you know, goes into great depth to all of the components that we touched on here today. So folks, if they want to go down the rabbit hole a little further, can can dive into it themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if people want to keep up with you, your research and your work, where's the best place to do so? Yeah, so I, I'm on Twitter, Deirdre underscore Tobias. Um, you can follow me there. Um, and then I, if you want to see the actual science, um, rather than my like GIF version of it, you can check it out uh, cartoon free on PubMed, just, you know, by searching my name and there's a handful of papers there that someone might find of interest. So, yeah. Yes, well, we'll definitely include, uh, this paper and some others there in the show notes as well for people to explore. So awesome. Deirdre, thanks again. Really appreciate your time today. You're so welcome. It was great talking. <laughs>